everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our Saturday webinar session. Uh, and I'm glad to be here with all my distinguished colleagues uh, on the panel and also with Daniel Martin. Um, so, uh, looks like today is going to be a structural heart day. So, Dr. William has uh, spoken to us about how you detect uh, uh, structural heart disease uh, by doing a few tests and also he mentioned a little bit about what kind of symptom that you have to pay attention to when you or your loved one may have a structural heart problem. So once you diagnose with the structural heart problem, so what will be next? So of course, uh, we need to explore what kind of treatment we can offer for the patient. So it's my turn now to talk about structural heart disease intervention. So in the last few years, uh, we see a great advancement in the medical technology and the medical devices. And this has uh, shown a great impact on how we treat patients with structural heart problem. The catheter-based uh, structure intervention procedure has become less invasive, safer, and also very effective, which potentially can be done safely for our elderly patient with structural heart disease. So uh, uh, let's move on. So uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of you probably quite familiar when we mention about heart problem, you're all quite familiar with what we call coronary heart disease, which is basically meaning having a blockage in the heart. And ballooning and stenting is commonly done for this problem. Uh, also, uh, quite commonly known people can have irregular heartbeat, but not many of you are aware about structural heart disease. So what we mean by structural heart disease is basically any form of heart disease that involve abnormality or defect in the structure of the heart. So what we mean by structure in the heart, as you, you can see here on the picture, on the top uh, right hand of the picture, you can see people can have, can have a defect uh, on the wall inside the heart, which is basically uh, called a septum. Uh, people can also have a, a, a problem with the valve. As Dr. William mentioned before, we all have four different valves in the heart, which is two on the right and two on the left. It's one of these valves can have a problem, and this is all considered to have a structural heart problem uh, or structural heart disease. The other thing, you can also have an abnormality in the cardiac chamber. This is all included in the category of having a structural heart disease. So uh, I like to use analogy when I explain uh, a heart problem to my patient because sometimes it could be very complex. So I would tell my patient, imagine your house, uh, imagine your heart is like a house. So basically, if you think about your house, you can have a problem with your plumbing, you can have a problem with your electricity, you can also have a problem with your house, house structure. You can have a hole in the wall, you can have a problem with the door, and you can also have a problem with the room inside the house. So you have a problem with your plumbing, it's like your plumbing get choked. So this is almost like having a blockage in your heart artery. And this is when people need to go for ballooning or stenting. You can also have a problem with the electricity in the house. And this is commonly known as having irregular heartbeat. So now you can also have a problem with the structural uh, 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 in, in the heart as well. So, uh, for example, uh, you can also have a, a defect in the hole in the, in the wall and uh, you can imagine uh, this is what we call having a uh, septal defect. Uh, you, uh, the valve in the heart is actually function like the door inside your house, which is open and closed with every heartbeat. Now, people can have a problem with the opening of the valve, which is we call having a narrow valve or a problem with a narrowing of the valve. On the other hand, people can also have a problem with closing of the valve. And this is what we call having a leaky valve. So again, uh, this is all can happen on each of the chamber inside the heart. In, in normal people, we have four different chambers in the heart. So I guess hopefully this analogy can help you to differentiate what, kind, uh, what a different type of heart problem you, you can encounter uh, as a patient. And I guess as I say that you always have to call the right person for the right problem. So if you have a problem with your plumbing, then of course you will call a plumber. If you have a problem with electricity, you also call electrician. But if you have a problem with the uh, structure in your heart, you call a structural heart disease specialist. And I would like to uh, uh, call ourselves, it's like a handyman. You can see here in the picture, we have all this tool that we put in the toolbox. It's basically getting ready to basically try to fix all uh, the problem uh, with your heart structure. So why we need to talk about structural heart disease? Singapore population is aging and our life expectancy is getting longer and longer. If you look at the data in 2008, 
only 9% of our patient, uh, our population uh, will be above age of 65. And that number is going up to almost 14% in 2018. And then based on, on, on the prediction uh, from uh, um, this website, then uh, it's expected to double in 2030, which is not too far off from, from now. So in uh, 2030, it is expected one in four uh, population, which is about 24% of uh, our population will be above the age of 65. So of course, uh, in the near future, the, the number of patients with structural heart disease is, are expected to increase. Just to give you an example, uh, this is uh, the data from our center, and this is using a local uh, database population in Singapore uh, for patient who has aortic stenosis. Uh, aortic stenosis is the narrowing of the aortic valve, which is one of the more common problem in structural heart disease. You can see here, the main age uh, patient who get the diagnosis is about 71. So let's talk about how we treat uh, a patient with a structural heart disease. So in the early states or in the beginning states, we like to initiate medication. But of course, when the states progress or the disease becoming serious or when the patient becomes symptomatic, the medication by itself will not be as effective. And this is when you have to consider treatment. And the, the only curative treatment for patients with structural heart disease is basically undergoing an intervention. Now, of course, in the past, a surgery probably the only choice to, to, uh, to cure this problem. But of course, uh, as I mentioned before, with the growing technology in the medical devices and the medical technology, percutaneous intervention, which is the catheter-based procedure, has taken a major role in the last few years. So let me tell you what we mean by structural uh, uh, intervention. So the structural intervention is basically a catheter-based uh, intervention. Uh, as you can see here on the diagram on the left hand side, this is the picture of the catheter. So the, the catheter is basically a small tube that has a, a cavity or space uh, inside the catheter itself. And then based uh, on the size of the cardiac devices that you want to put on the catheter, you can choose between the small catheter, the intermediate size catheter, or even the large size catheter. So on the video here, you can see here, uh, this is the cardiac plug that I use uh, to uh, basically to treat a patient who have a whole defect in the heart. You can see here, I'm trying to basically uh, insert that cardiac plug uh, to, uh, to put it inside that uh, small catheter. And the, the advantage of using uh, this catheter-based intervention, as you can see here, that plug, once uh, we put it inside the catheter, the size will be smaller and it will be in the elongated form. So if you put a smaller device inside the patient body, usually by right, it's going to be safer. So how we do get access? So once we get uh, the, the device, we put it inside the catheter, the next step will be to get the access into the patient body. And in the majority of the case, we get the access uh, from the femoral artery or the femoral venous, which is located around the groin area. And the reason why we choose uh, this groin area because it's very accessible uh, for the doctor. And also in the majority of the case, there's not many important structure around the groin area. Uh, we have muscle, fat, bone, but there's not many other important structure around the area. As you can see here, uh, I'm trying to put a catheter inside the groin and uh, on the right hand side, and this is the size of the scar after we're done with the procedure. And of course, you can see that this, uh, the size of the scar is significantly smaller compared to patient underwent an open heart surgery. So let's go for uh, one of the example, uh, how we do uh, this uh, 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 intervention procedure. So patient with atrial septal defect. Atrial septal defect is basically uh, is a condition that patient was born with. Uh, you were born with having a hole in the heart, as you can see uh, on the picture on the left hand side. So basically, uh, nowadays, uh, the way we treat this patient in a majority of the case, we can do uh, what we call a percutaneous treatment without the need uh, to go for open heart surgery. So basically, we put uh, the cardiac plug, uh, which we use uh, to close the hole. Uh, we put it inside the catheter. As you can see here in the video, once we put the, the plug inside the catheter, we can then just cross the hole and then deploy the plug to basically cover the hole on each side. The beauty of this procedure, this procedure uh, usually takes about an hour. In majority of the cases, it's even less than an hour. The procedure is very safe and the patient can go home the next day after the procedure. The other procedure that I want to talk about is that's becoming more and more popular and more commonly done in our center will be what we call a transcatheter aortic valve implantation or the short form uh, we call a TAVI. 
so the TAFI procedure was done to treat patient uh, with problem called severe aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis is basically having a severe narrowing of the aortic valve. And once the, the narrowing becoming severe or patient becoming more symptomatic, then the only treatment that works is basically by replacing the aortic valve with the new artificial heart valve. Uh, of course, in the past, the only way to put the new heart valve inside the patient's body will be performing an open heart surgery. But in 2002, as what you can see in the picture, one doctor in France perform, performed the first TAVI in the world. And of course, this procedure was uh, performed out of desperation. This is a patient who is very sick uh, but need to have a treatment, otherwise his, uh, he will die from his condition. And, but he's considered uh, too high risk to undergo an open heart surgery. So basically, Dr. Kribier uh, performed uh, the TAVI for the patient. Of course, it took him a few hours with a lot of limitation, but he successfully uh, completed the procedure and the procedure uh, was successful. As you can see here on the picture, he basically interacted with this patient a uh, few days after the procedure. But this is uh, served as an, a very important milestone uh, in the field of structural intervention because this is, uh, has served as a proof of concept that even the human artificial valve can be implanted into the patient body without the need of doing an open heart surgery. So again, as all the new devices and all the new, new procedure, they have to go a vigorous test. And uh, this one takes uh, a few years to conduct all these tests. This was done uh, all over the world. If you can see uh, here, I want you to uh, pay attention to the left hand side. Uh, this is the study that was done over the last few years comparing uh, the TAVI as a new procedure compared to gold standard uh, open heart surgery. So if you can see here, you pay attention, there's two lines that basically interlap uh, within each other, suggesting that both procedure has no significant difference in terms of the efficacy and the side effect. But over the years, the TAVI procedure grow. We have uh, newer devices, we have the newer technology, and of course, we gain more experience as a doctor and also a medical team. And in our center now, in fact, we use the third generation of the TAVI devices. And I want you to pay attention now to the right hand side. If you can see here, the last few years, the study suggests actually, if you perform a TAVI for a, sp a specific patient population, actually the TAVI result probably could be better and safer, especially if you perform a TAVI for elderly, uh, elderly patient. So this is how we perform a TAVI procedure in our center. Uh, majority of the case now is performed under sedation, so patient does not need to go uh, under GA. And again, I mentioned that the access usually from the femoral artery, which is around the groin area. And the way we deploy the valve, as you, you can see here in the video, basically we just inflate the balloon and probably it takes us about five seconds to inflate that balloon. And once the balloon is inflated, then the new valve will be anchored to the new position. And the beauty of this procedure, once you uh, inflate that balloon and you finish with it, the valve will uh, work immediately. And that is the reason why the procedure is safer and the whole procedure usually takes about one or two hours. And the good thing about this procedure, the length of stay in the hospital will be significantly shorter. Uh, in majority of the case, patients only need to spend about three or four days in the hospital. And of course, the immediate post-recovery period uh, at home will be uh, shorter and easier. The other procedure that I want to mention about uh, is uh, uh, clip devices for mitral regurgitation. So mitral regurgitation is basically uh, is on the other side, uh, is basically completely different from what the condition that I mentioned before. Mitral regurgitation is defined as having a, a, a problem with the leaking of the valve. Patients who have a mitral regurgitation will have a significant symptom as such as breathlessness. Uh, they are unable to sleep flat because they feel like they're drowning. And of course, without a significant treatment, uh, repairing the valve or replacing of uh, the valve, then the patient will go into heart failure. You can see on the picture, all this uh, uh, significant color that you see on the echocardiogram is the representation of how much of the leaking uh, blood that you see as a backflow from the heart. So I want to show the picture here. This is all the preparation that we do before we put a clip for the patient. You can see there's a lot of tray there, there's a lot of catheter, there's a lot of device. And then uh, again, this is the work of a team. It cannot just be done by one person. Um, and then also there's a monitoring from the hemodynamic. You can see here that we all watch on the monitor. But just to assure you, all this device, all this, uh, a lot of device, this is all was located outside the patient body. 
what goes inside the patient body is basically just this clip, which you can see here on the monitor. There's two different types of clip. If we put a small clip, the clip size is only about 9 millimeter, which is about 1 centimeter. As you compare with the larger clip, it's probably about 1.5 centimeter. You see on the video here, we uh, um, managed to place this clip for the patient who has severe leaking of the mitral valve. And you can see uh, on the bottom picture, uh, the clip was successfully placed. And this is a beautiful picture from our 3D uh, machine. You can show here that the clip is in a stable position. And basically after this procedure, uh, the, the degree of the leaking of the patient was significantly reduced. So again, all this procedure was made possible because again, there's an advancement in the medical technology. One of the advancements in the medical technology to help us doing this procedure is what we call the imaging, uh, the imaging machine. So the imaging is basically function like a, a camera that guide us doing the procedure. And you can see here, we move from the black and white picture on the left hand side. So the picture on the right hand side, which you see, this is a color picture, a beautiful picture of your heart valve, which is opening and closed. And I don't know whether you realize or not, this is actually a moving picture. So this is actually a live picture from the moving heart uh, uh, by using this camera. And uh, this, this is the size of the camera is very small. And this is what we call a TEE probe. And you can uh, basically, we put it uh, on the patient throat during the procedure. And again, this is uh, another example of the beautiful picture that you can see here. Uh, on the left hand side, you probably can appreciate this is a patient who have a hole in the heart. And then on the right hand side, uh, this is we are about ready to basically deploy the plug. And that's the tip of the catheter. And you can see it clearly again with the 3D imaging. So last but not least, uh, let's say that we deal with the complex procedure and then uh, we deal with the patient who has a difficult anatomy of the heart, uh, a little bit of uh, out of uh, normal range. Uh, there's always a concern we're not going inside the heart. So how we can get a good visualization of the heart structure, etc. So we can do what we call a 3D heart printing uh, of your heart. So like this patient here, this is a very complex procedure. We uh, put the patient on the CT scan machine and based on the data that we get from the CT scan machine, we basically print uh, his heart, uh, 3D printing uh, in the actual size of the heart. And you can see here my hand uh, basically rehearsed uh, before the procedure to make sure that the catheter go into the right direction and that's where the heart, heart valve will be implanted. So I guess in summary, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the transcatheter treatment that we have here is available as an alternative to open heart surgery. Not all patients will be suitable for this treatment, although the majority will be. So the patient who will uh, who want to be considered for this treatment will need to be seen by a cardiologist and who need to go uh, probably one or two a screening test before they uh, deem suitable. Please get the treatment early if you know or you suspect that you have a structural heart disease. And it's a very exciting field to be in nowadays because the treatment in the structural heart disease will continue to grow rapidly in the near future. So uh, before I end my talk, uh, I would like to uh, give a question uh, for the audience. Uh, uh, hopefully uh, you all can answer this by now after my presentation. So uh, the question is the intervention or cure for structural heart disease can only be done by open heart surgery. You can put your answer now. A is true and B is false. Let's uh, give uh, them about 15 seconds or so. All right, let's uh, see the answer from the audience. All right, so majority of you, 95% uh, um, basically uh, say it's, it's false, which I'm, uh, I'm glad that I basically uh, convey the message to all of you. So basically the cure uh, intervention treatment for structural heart disease now will be a combination of uh, surgical intervention and percutaneous based uh, structural intervention procedure. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.